so it's uh, August 11th, 2022, and I am interested in going into the, um, let's see, I don't know how to do this here. Well, the security was just a check of uh, the driver's license. This is a NASA research park for the most part. Years ago when I took my Zeppelin ride, we landed here after the 11 hour trip up from Long Beach and the headquarters of the um, Airship Ventures company was I think right in this building here. They used to have a uh, model Zeppelin out in front. It was either that or it was this other building up here, I'm not sure which. Actually, I think more likely this one. Yeah, that's looking more like it. It doesn't look like a terribly used building now, but that was where they were apparently based. Hangar 1 is right up here. You can see the superstructure of it. Not sure where this museum is. It should be right here according to the, uh, or maybe up a ways. couple airplanes up here, maybe that's where it's at. NASA Ames Conference Center. Ah, Moffett Field Museum. That away. Gotta love it. Moffat Museum parking, apparently right here. There are the uh, big Zeppelin or dirigible hangars, two of them. And this was uh, one of the bases that was used for the pre-World War II uh, Navy uh, blimp and dirigible fleets that were patrolling the waters. Um, uh, down in the Long Beach area or somewhere in that neck of the woods, there's still at least one of these. Uh, they use it as a movie studio for certain specific things when they need a really huge open space but still under a roof. And uh, Lakehurst, New Jersey, uh, Tillamook, Oregon have hangars of the same or very similar design. Uh, the, one of the ones at Tillamook burned down, but there's still one standing. Um, and then of course we've got this hangar one. Which is getting some sort of a restoration. They've pulled all the outer skin off of it. Last time I was here, it had the skin. Oh, I was going to say that when I did my uh, Zeppelin trip many years ago that went from Long Beach, California on the 11-hour flight up the coast and uh, landed here after dark, it was right next to that hangar over there. It was actually just off to the left as we're looking at it. Anyway, um, when I was here that time, this thing still had its skin on it. And its future was uh, doubtful. It looks like the money has come from somewhere. The Hangar One Project, Moffett Field, Federal Airfield, Mountain View, uh, General Contractor McCarthy Building. I don't know what they're doing with it exactly, but all sorts of restoration, clearly.
That's the main reason I came here. I just wanted to see what this guy looked like now. Shenandoah Plaza, historic district. Shenandoah was one of the Navy's very large dirigibles in the between the wars period. back a little further. Lots and lots of details about the goings on here. <clears throat> so the uh, docent here said that uh, Google owns this Hangar One now, and they're they have plans for it. They signed a lease, or either they don't own. I think they're leasing it technically for for quite a period of time. And so the original skin had toxic materials on it, which could not be practically removed. So that's been stripped and disposed of. And now the superstructure is being sandblasted and recoated. And then they're going to put on a new coating. And uh, Google will use it in whichever way they have intended. Now I also heard that in one of the hangars across the field, one of the founders of Google, he said, I don't know who that would be, if it's Jeff, or not Jeff Bezos, that's Amazon, but one of the founders of Google um, is building a new dirigible currently in one of those hangars. Maybe they envision housing it in Hangar 1. I wish I had more time here. Um, I didn't think there was as much of this museum as there is. And there is supposed to be a train layout back here. Two trains. Just to give a quick snapshot of this. A multi level. Train layout. Thank you, sir. Okay. Enjoy. Very nice. <laughs> Wish I had more time to check this out. This I didn't know this was this even. It was a big hobby room. This yeah. The technicians that worked on the P3 Orion subchaser planes for 30 years, they flew out of mm -hmm. here. Um, you know, and this was their spot. To Did they have a model train in here, or was it just a general relaxation room? It was just general relaxation work on it, what have you. Mm -hmm. Express relief room. So. Okay. Yeah. 
they, they started in 1978, and the Navy left in 1994, and I got abandoned. They had a local train truck took it over, and I'm, like, I'm just a volunteer for the museum, but mm -hmm. when I feel I get to play with trains, <laughs> I signed up quick. Very nice. I'll show this to a few people I know. Okay, I've got about 10 minutes. <laughs> uh, World War II vintage Jeep carcass, missing some parts. And over here we have a uh, 1942 Volte BT-13A Valiant. Under camouflage netting. front of something. Looks like a uh, U-2, huh? NASA U-2. Because this is a NASA facility, not an Air Force facility, it makes sense that these planes, at least a lot of them, are uh, NASA-related aircraft. This aircraft, NASA 708, with its sister ship, NASA 709, was obtained from the U.S. Air Force in 1971 to test the instrumentation systems being developed for the early Landsat Earth observing satellites. The results were so successful that the program was extended with the aircraft becoming significant Earth observing platforms in their own right. Because they were capable of gathering air samples at altitudes above 90 percent of the Earth's atmosphere, they also became instrumental in studying atmospheric composition. These data made significant contributions to early ozone studies. NASA's U-2s were the last of the original production runs starting in the 1950s to remain on flight status. They were designed during the Cold War to overfly the Soviet Union to gather intelligence. Both U-2s were capable of being outfitted for naval carrier operations. Upon retirement in 1987, NASA 709 set 16 international time to climb and cruise altitude records in two weight classes. 
the work done by the NASA U-2s in the 70s and 80s continues today using ER-2 aircraft. These airplanes with their larger wing and higher payload are deployed around the world gathering, da gathering data on Earth resources, celestial events, atmospheric dynamics, and oceanographic processes. There we go. And there's a... Uh, looks like it's probably a flying mock-up, I'm not sure. No signage. There's an F-104, also a NASA livery. So it's a TF-104G Starfighter. The two-seat TF-104G Starfighter was transferred from German Air Force to NASA in 1975 where it was assigned to the Dryden Flight Research Center. This aircraft's early assignments included high-speed support and photo chase, which included high mat aircraft testing. In the late 70s, it was used to simulate the landing characteristics of the X-24 lifting body. During the 1980s, it served as a high-speed, low-G flight facility that was capable of sustaining zero Gs for up to 60 seconds. This was accomplished by flying parabolic tra trajectories, reaching maximum altitudes of 70,000 to 75,000 feet. The TF-104G's last project was the flight testing of a remote vision system. It's speculated that the hypersonic flight vehicles of tomorrow will not allow the pilot a traditional windshield with which to view the world. This aircraft was the next to the last F-104 on flight status with NASA. It last flew on January 24, 1994, completing a total of 1,890 hours of NASA service. So we got a Cobra here, but this is not especially NASA, right? This was being worked on by NASA. Okay. Yeah. It was actually a parts for. Okay. They've always got something going on here for research, uh, mm -hmm. trying to do the navigation better. Right. So when you go I found down, out that access to that gated area is only by tour, so I'd kind of cut in. The other people who were in there already were apparently part of a tour, and the docent says, no, you can't be out here by yourself. <laughs> we got to get you out of here. But luckily, I just finished looking at the planes, and I'm exactly out of time. This is the time I estimated I needed to leave to get to the next place I'm going today. So I'm glad I got to take a look at Hangar 1 and see how it's going and get a quick taste of this museum. Next time I'm out here, I'll have to give it some more time, especially the indoor parts, some really interesting dirigible-related exhibits. There's a uh, plane over there. I think that's one of the conveyors. Uh, that may actually be uh, an Orion. Yeah, it's a Navy. What are those, P3s? I'm not really good with the naval designations. In one quarter mile, turn left on North Akron Road. Turn left on North Akron Road. Okay, getting the hell out of Dodge here. One of the other guys said that this and facility was nearly abandoned. To the end of the street. But now that NASA is doing more stuff here again. It's kind of getting fixed up. There's some huge wind tunnels over in that direction. Very famous ones. I think they've been there for decades. You can kind of get a glimpse of them maybe as we go by. I could see them approaching the area. They're so big. But some of these buildings in the way might uh, make that difficult. Bush 
Bushnell Road, then take back the there. first right. I don't know if I'm allowed to go back here or not. There's some more of them, those big buildings there are the uh, wind tunnels. One quarter mile. Turn left on US 101 North. 